Today, we are making sourdough bagels. What is up everybody? Welcome back to the Barney Homestead. My name is Jess Barney and today I'm gonna to be showing you how I make these delicious, soft, and chewy sourdough bagels right at home. I'm gonna show you the whole process from start to finish and teach you some tips and tricks along the way that'll hopefully help you create these delicious sourdough bagels at home for yourself. Now, before we get into it, there's something that I wanna address and that is how long do these bagels take to make? If you are new to sourdough, it's important to know that sourdough recipes typically take anywhere from 12 hours to 48 hours from start to finish. Sourdough tends to be a little bit of a longer process when it comes to baking. This is because sourdough baking uses a wild yeast, which is your sourdough starter, and that wild yeast takes extra time to do its fermentation. It's not like baking with a commercially made yeast that gives you a rise in just a couple hours. My sourdough bagel recipe takes a little over 24 hours from start to finish, from the time you are mixing your ingredients to when they are ready to eat. So if you wanna have fresh homemade sourdough bagels on a Saturday morning, you are gonna to wanna to start this recipe Friday morning the day before. These bagels also freeze incredibly well, so they are a great make-ahead option for freezer or meal prep too. There are four main parts to this recipe that I am gonna walk you through. The initial mix and bulk fermentation, the cold proof, the shaping, and then the boil and bake. So now let's hop back to yesterday and let's get started. All right, so now I am going to start my initial sourdough bagel mixture and begin the bulk fermentation process. I use a couple tools and then the four ingredients to get this started. So first off, I've got my bread bowl here, just a bowl that's big enough to hold the dough and also give you room for the dough to rise. I have got a digital kitchen scale. A scale is super important because you definitely wanna make sure you are accurate with your measurements for your ingredients. And then I have a Danish dough whisk. Honestly, anything that will help you with the mixing is fine. I've used silicone spatulas in the past. You can just use your hands. I do like to use a whisk for the initial mixture. And then I've got the four ingredients for my dough. So first and foremost, I have my active sourdough starter here that was fed last night. So it is at peak activity. I have a glass of filtered water. I have my salt and then of course my bread flour. Now for my sourdough bagel recipe, I stick with these four main ingredients. I've seen recipes out there that also add things like oil or honey or sugar to the dough mixture. And quite frankly, I've experimented with them, but I don't find that it makes that much of a difference. So I stick with the basic four ingredients. The other thing that I have found as I have experimented with sourdough recipes is the amount of water that you are putting in your dough mixture. So a lot of the recipes that I have seen use anywhere between 250 and 300 grams of water. This typically results in a stiffer dough and a denser bagel in the end. I enjoy a bagel with a medium exterior crust that has a bit of crunch, but I still want the inside to be tender and chewy and soft. So to achieve that, I have adjusted my recipe in the amount of water that it uses, and it uses 325 grams of water um, to the dough mixture. So I'm again at 325 grams of water. So let's go ahead and get this mixed together. I'm gonna turn my scale on, place my bowl on it, tear it so that I'm back at zero, and I'm gonna start with my active sourdough starter. I add 125 grams of sourdough starter to my bowl. All right. And then again, to the sourdough starter, I'm gonna tear my scale and I'm gonna add 325 grams of filtered water. Now I'm gonna take my whisk and gently combine that sourdough starter and water and start to break up that starter. What you are looking to achieve here is a milky white water, milky white water. 
as I am combining these two, I am looking for the sourdough starter to kind of break up and dissolve into the water. And I will be left with a milky white water, which you can see right there in the bowl. Next, I'm going to add my 10 grams of salt. And once I have this salt added, I just use my whisk to give it a little stir to make sure that it's not just in one big clump at the bottom. And I'm gonna tear my scale one more time. And now I am going to add my 500 grams of bread flour. So these amounts of ingredients, your 125 grams of active sourdough starter, 325 grams of filtered water, 10 grams of salt, and 500 grams of bread flour are going to make a total of eight bagels in the end. So this is enough for a total of eight bagels. All right, so I've got my flour in there and I am going to use my whisk and start to mix together these ingredients. As you are mixing, you will notice that the dough quickly becomes pretty tough to mix together. So I just do the initial mixture with this dough whisk, and then I am honestly just gonna switch to my hand. You wanna make sure that your ingredients are really well incorporated. The dough is still going to look pretty shaggy, might even look a little bit dry, that's okay, and it's normal. You are going to next give your dough time to hydrate, but this initial mixture, just wanna give it a few pinches, a few kneads with your hand until it's all well incorporated. It's gonna be sticky. You're gonna have some left in your hands. It's totally fine. It'll wash right off. All right. So here is my initial dough mixture. You can see, looks kind of rough and shaggy, but everything is nicely combined. That's exactly what we're looking for. So now that I have finished my initial mix of the dough, I am going to cover this and let it sit for 90 minutes. You can cover it with a damp tea towel, or in this case for me, I am using this beeswax wrap. So you just cover your bowl and you're gonna let it sit for 90 minutes. During this 90 minute time frame, the flour is going to really hydrate with the water and that is going to help start the gluten development in the flour. So I'll see you back in 90 minutes. Okay, so it's been 90 minutes. The dough has rested. It's been doing its magic in the bowl. And now I am going to start my first round of what's called stretch and folds. And this is where you start to incorporate air into the dough and also start to, again, continue to enhance and develop that gluten structure. So I am going to zoom you into the bowl so you can see what I'm doing. So all you're gonna need for this is a small bowl filled with some filtered water. So, you can see that the dough is mostly hydrated, but there's a few little dry bits. So we're gonna go ahead and work that dough together. So I'm gonna wet my fingertips and my hand with my bowl of water, and you are just going to start pinching the dough. And really what you're doing, pinching, kneading, whatever you wanna call it, but we really wanna make sure that everything is well incorporated. It's not gonna take much, but you wanna just go through it a few times with your hand, your fingertips, and pinch that dough and really make sure that again, everything is well incorporated. So as I am doing this, I'm again, just kind of feeling around in the dough to make sure that there's no dry bits or anything that is left. And you can see as I start to do this, the consistency of the dough looks a lot better. Um, it might be a little hard to see on the camera, but when you do it yourself, you'll be able to see Again, there were a couple small dry bits still left before I started this, and now it is all combined and really 
nicely blended together. So now that I have got my dough really nice and worked together, I'm gonna do what's called the stretches and folds. And all you're gonna do is, again, wet your fingertips in your hand, and you're going to take the dough from one side, stretch it up until you meet resistance, and fold it over. Turn your bowl a quarter of a turn, pick up the other side, stretch it until it won't stretch anymore, and fold it over. I'm gonna go a third time. You can even kind of, you know, again, wiggle it a little bit, stretch it, and fold it over and then a fourth time. You wanna go at least around your dough once. If your dough is giving you enough stretch, you can go another time, so there I'll probably finish at five. And then I'm just going to take my hand and kind of work that dough back into a ball. So instead of just kind of being, you know, very stretched out in the bowl when we started, we're starting to develop that gluten, and so we can get that nice ball shape with the dough. So now that I've done that first round of stretch and folds and pinching that dough and mixing it together, I'm going to put my beeswax wrap, or if you're using a tea towel, put that back on your bowl, and your bowl is going to sit on your counter for another 30 to 45 minutes, and you're gonna do one more round of stretches and folds. So I'll be back to show you what that looks like in about 45 minutes. All right, it's been 45 minutes. Let's take one more up close look at the dough and do our final round of stretch and folds. So this is after 45 minutes. You can see from when we left it last time and it was in that nice kind of ball shape, it's starting to spread out a little bit again. Totally fine, so now we're going to go in and do another round of stretch and folds. I'm gonna wet my fingertips in my hand. Again, grab from one side. You can see how much more it stretches this time around. Fold it over. Turn the bowl a quarter turn, stretch it, fold it over. Give it another quarter turn, stretch and fold. Go at least one complete time around. I might be able to get one more. You can see this last one, how much less stretching I get. That's what you want. You're building, again, that gluten structure. So now that I've done that round of stretch and folds, I'm just gonna create that nice ball shape again with my dough, and I'm all set. You can already see I'm starting to get some fermentation bubbles, which is exciting. All right, so I've completed my second round of stretch and folds, and that's all I need to do. Now the dough is going to sit and bulk ferment for the next six to 10 hours. So I'm gonna put my cover back on top, and I'm gonna place my bowl in a warm spot. For me, that warm spot is going to be in my laundry room because that is where my furnace is located, so that room tends to be a little bit warmer. Ideally, you wanna place your bowl in a room that is about 70 to 74 degrees, but again, don't sweat it if it's a little bit cooler or a little bit warmer. If your room runs on the cooler side, that means that your bulk fermentation might take a little bit longer to complete versus if you run on the warmer side, your bulk fermentation probably will take a little bit less time to complete. What you're gonna be looking for at the end of bulk fermentation is for your dough to have risen about 50 to 75% and you should start to see some fermentation bubbles right underneath the surface of the dough. I would recommend starting to check your dough at about the four hour mark to see how your bulk fermentation is going. So I will come back at the end of my bulk fermentation to show you what the dough looks like and also to talk to you about what you're gonna do next. All right, everyone, it has been about five and a half hours since my last stretch and fold, and my dough has finished its bulk fermentation. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like because again, timing is going to differ. What you're looking for are these kind of signs and signals that your dough has finished bulk fermentation. So let's take a peek at the dough. This has risen about 50%. If you scroll back earlier in the video, you can take a peek at what it looked like when we finished the stretches and folds. But as you can see, it has risen and it looks nice and smooth and cohesive. So again, looking for about 50 to 75% rise. 
A couple other things that are gonna tell you that bulk fermentation is complete. The other sign that bulk fermentation is complete is when you can see these little air bubbles in the top of your dough. There's a bigger one right there. That is a good sign that your fermentation is actively happening and your dough is doing what it needs to do. And then finally, if you look around the edges, you can see how the edges almost looked curved. It almost looks like the dough is starting to pull away from the sides of the bowl. There's a good shot right there. That is what you wanna see as well. So again, I am finished now with bulk fermentation for my dough. The next part is going to be the cold proof. And for this, it's super easy. You're going to cover your bowl back up. So I've got my beeswax wrap on top and you're gonna put it in your refrigerator overnight. That's it. Don't worry about it. Just put it in your fridge overnight. This is going to start the cold proof process. So what happens during the cold proof overnight? Well, really fermentation continues to happen. Your dough is going to continue to ferment. That sourdough flavor is gonna to continue to develop in your dough, but the cold temperature helps it happen at a much slower rate. So earlier when I said you wanted your dough to only rise about 50 to 75%, it's because when you put it in the fridge for its cold proof, it's going to continue to ferment just at a slower pace. So you don't want it to completely double in size while you're doing your bulk fermentation at room temperature because then it might get a little over fermented, over proofed in the refrigerator overnight. So again, I'm gonna take my bowl, I'm gonna put it in my refrigerator and I will see you in the morning when we are finished with cold proofing and we are ready for step three, which is shaping our bagels. Good morning, guys. It is bagel baking day. This is the most exciting part. I haven't even had coffee yet and I am just this jazzed because I am so excited to make these bagels. So let me talk to you a little bit about what you're gonna need to set yourself up to start shaping these bagels. So I have cleaned my work surface. I am just using my countertop and I have dusted it with flour. You're also going to need a baking sheet with parchment paper on top. You will wanna have a bench scraper or something to cut the dough with standing by and I think that's it. So I'm gonna zoom you in and show you how we start shaping these bagels um, to get them ready to boil and bake. So let's get started. So first things first, this is my dough. The now that it's come out of the fridge still looks really, really nice. I'm gonna start by just taking this and putting it on the floured work surface. When you go to take it out, you'll notice some webbing in the dough. It should look nice and kind of light and bubbly. It's exactly what you're looking for. Get as much out as you can. And I am going to start by just kind of gently shaping this into a circle. So now that I've got my circle, I'm gonna take my bench scraper and start dividing this up. I am going to cut it in half. Remember this recipe makes eight bagels, so then I'm gonna cut these quarters into, or I'm sorry, the half into quarters and the quarters in half as well. You can definitely use a scale for this part if you want, but as long as they're mostly the same size, that'll be just fine. It gives it a little bit more of a rustic look when they're not all perfect. So now we're gonna start shaping the bagel. So to shape the bagel, you're gonna want a part of your work surface that doesn't have a ton of flour on it. The bottom is already floured because we dumped it onto the floured surface, and now we're gonna move it to a non-floured surface. You're gonna start by just gently stretching the dough. You don't wanna deflate all of the air bubbles, but just give it a stretch. And then you're gonna start taking the sides of it and folding it towards the middle and using your other hand to kind of hold them in place. So do you see how I'm kind of creating like this round shape and just working my way around the dough. So 
So now that I've got my little kind of round shape with my seam up here, you're going to flip it over so the seam side is down and you're going to cup the ball with your hand. So you're really looking to create, you're going to use your uh, pinky finger and your thumb and then the side of your palm to kind of create this pocket around the dough. And what you're going to do is just gently start to create small circular motions with your hand. And what you'll feel is the ball is going to start to move around in your hand. But the reason you want an unfloured surface is because you want to feel that little bit of tug at the bottom of the ball. Because what this is doing is it's sealing the seam that we just made. If your hands stick a little bit to the dough, you can just gently flour your hand and keep going around. So you're just, again, going to take this small circular motions. And when I'm finished, you can see how the seam is nice and closed. And I've got my nice ball shape. So I dip the bottom in a little bit of flour. And then I'm just going to put it on my baking sheet. So I'll show you another one. So again, you're kind of just going to gently stretch your dough out a little bit. And then you're going to start to bring the sides in to the middle. Start to create that round, that ball shape. This also, again, helps to build tension on the surface of the dough. So once I've got my ball shape, I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to start this motion. If you feel like the dough ball is sliding around too much because maybe you have excess flour, just give it a few seconds. The flour will absorb into the dough and you'll start to feel that little bit of resistance as you're going around. So I've got my nice ball and my seam is now closed. So I'm gonna dip it in just a little bit of flour and put it on my baking sheet. So I'm gonna go ahead and work on these other six and then we'll be back. So now that we have got all of our bagels shaped, I am just going to gently sprinkle the top with a little bit of flour, just so that they don't stick to the towel. And then you're gonna take a tea towel, cover them up, and let them take a little rest for 30 minutes. So while your bagels are resting for 30 minutes, you're gonna do a couple other things. You are gonna start prepping for the fourth step, which is the boil and bake. So start preheating your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit and start getting a large pot of water boiling. So I'm gonna be using my stock pot right here and I'm going to bring the water inside that to a boil. The other thing that's a really good time to do while these bagel balls are resting is to prepare your toppings. So if you're doing things like cheeses on top or everything bagel seasoning, maybe a garlic topping, whatever you want to put on top, now's a good time to get that prepared and get them out into their plates or bowls, whatever you're going to put them on to dip your bagels in. So the reason why you want the bagels to rest for 30 minutes before we go and actually poke the hole in them to turn them into actual bagels is because your dough was cold when you used it this morning. You took it out of the fridge and cold dough tends to seize up the more cutting you do or the more you break the bonds of that dough. So we've already cut the dough and now we've shaped it into the ball shapes. So we're gonna let it rest for 30 minutes to let the gluten relax so that when we go to poke the hole in them, they're not fighting us and wanting to just kind of like clump back together into a ball shape. This rest is gonna make sure that you can form the bagel nicely um, and really get that, you know, bagel shape that you're looking for. So we're gonna let these rest for 30 minutes and then we'll be back to do the final part of the shaping. All right, so our bagels have been resting for 30 minutes and now we are going to add the final shape to them, which is putting the hole in the middle. So you are going to take a piece of dough, start by putting your finger down in the middle of it. Go ahead and pick it up from your parchment paper and then you are going to start to work a hole 
in that dough. And then you're going to gently start to work your way around and stretch that hole out. So now I've got my bagel shape. Now I dip these in a little bit of flour simply because they will stick to the parchment paper and I don't like fighting it when I have to go to boil them. So I just dip it in a little bit of flour and you're going to put it back on your parchment paper. So one more will do. So again, I've got my bagel ball here. I'm going to take my finger and start to poke down into the middle, pick up my bagel ball, and then gently start to work a hole in that bagel. And then gently stretch the sides. So now I've got my bagel shape. I'm going to dip it in a little bit of flour. It's going to go right back on the baking sheet. So you're going to continue this until you're done with all of them. All right, so we are now in the home stretch. It is step four of the bagel making process, which is the final step, which is the boil and bake. So I have got my pot of boiling water right behind me here. My oven is preheated to 425 degrees. Now the reason you want to boil your bagels is because boiling is what's going to give it that soft and chewy and tender inside, and then the baking is what's going to give it that kind of crispy exterior part of your bagel. Now to your water, you're going to add some baking soda, about two tablespoons. You can eyeball it, doesn't need to be exact. Now. The baking soda is critical because what that's going to do is allow your bagels to develop that beautiful brown exterior crust while they're baking in the oven. So don't forget to add that to your water. So the last thing you're gonna to wanna to have on standby while you're boiling is some sort of timer. I'm just using my phone. You are going to boil these at a minute and a half per side. So I just turn this on and eyeball it as I add them to my pot. So again, I've got my water, my baking soda has been added, and you're just going to start adding your bagels one at a time. If your hole collapsed a little bit, you can open it back up before you drop it in. But you're just gonna drop it in the water. And if your water's at the right temperature, they should float right away like that one did. If it sinks to the bottom, just give it a few seconds, it'll pop back up towards the top. See, like that one sank a little bit, but it's coming back up. You don't want to overcrowd your pot. I can fit about four bagels in my pot at a time. So now that I've got them all in here, I'm going to just let them boil away for a minute and a half per side. Okay, so it has been a minute and a half. Now I'm going to take just a slotted spoon and I'm going to start gently flipping those bagels over. And now they're going to boil for another minute and a half on this side. Okay, so now that they have boiled for a minute and a half on each side, I am just going to take them out and put them back on my parchment paper. Parchment lined baking sheet. So now before you can add your bagels to the oven, you wanna add your toppings. So I am going to do a couple plain. So no toppings, just bake them plain. So my husband likes them. I have got some everything bagel seasoning on a plate here that I'm going to dip a few in. And then I'm going to do a few Asiago cheese top bagels. So I do not add any extra egg wash or anything to the bagel tops. You're more than happy to if you like that kind of egg wash flavor to your bagels, but I find the tackiness that they come out of the boil with is just enough to help the topping stick to the bagel. So I'm going to do, I think, just two plain and then three of each topping. So once your bagels are cool enough to handle, you're just going to take them and you're just gonna dip them in your topping. So this is everything bagel. I'm just gonna kind of work it around. So I've got a nice topping on that bagel and I'm just gonna place it back on my baking sheet. So you're just gonna keep adding your toppings until you're satisfied with how your bagels look. All right, so there's my everything. Now for the Asiago cheese ones, 
I tend to manually add the cheese to the top. It just doesn't stick quite as well, but I get a nice good coating on each bagel. These Asiago cheese ones are so good and they make the most amazing like bagels for lunch sandwiches. This is really the best part about making bagels is you can, you know, really kind of um, experiment with your flavor profiles just based on the toppings. I bet you like a garlic butter topping would be absolutely delicious too. There's so many different ones that you can probably think of and create. All right, so I've got all of my bagels topped now with their toppings, and now I'm going to add them to the oven. I am going to bake them between 25 and 30 minutes. You're going to rotate your pan halfway through baking, and they are going to be finished when they are browned to your liking. In my oven, it typically takes about 30 minutes. 25 isn't quite enough, but start checking them at about the 25 minute mark if you're making them at home. All right, so I will come back and show you what they look like when they are out of the oven. Okay, these bagels are out of the oven and I seriously wish I had smell-o-vision so that you guys could smell how amazing these Asiago cheese ones smell. Do you see what we have made? Look at how beautiful these are. So you'll notice that I have moved them to a cooling rack. You'll wanna do that right when they come out of the oven and you're going to let them cool. I just, I, I need to give you a close up of this. Look at that beautiful crust. Can you hear that? Crispy, but soft and tender and chewy on the inside. We'll cut into them in just a second, but you wanna remove them to a cooling rack and if you are gonna eat them fresh, let them cool for at least 30 minutes to just let some of that heat and steam kind of dissipate throughout the bagel and escape. If you are going to store them at room temperature, you will want to let them cool completely and then you can move them to a storage container, some sort of like glass or Tupperware container. You can put them in a plastic bag, whatever you're fancy. And the other thing is I have found that these freeze extremely, extremely well. I actually have a batch of them in the freezer that I made earlier this week, um, but these will freeze for about three months. Although to be quite honest, they're probably not gonna last that long in the freezer if you do end up putting them in there, but they're really great to have on hand. If you freeze them, I just take them out of the freezer and put them in the refrigerator and let them defrost overnight. And then you can toast them up the next morning. All right, so I showed you one of the plain ones. Let's take a look at one of these everything bagels. How gorgeous. And then, oh my gosh, these Asiago cheese ones smell so good. All right, I'm breaking the cardinal rule. I'm doing it. I'm cutting into one of these. I'm gonna do an Asiago cheese one. It's only been like 15 minutes. I can handle them. It's fine. I gotta just show you the inside of these and I have got to taste it. Oh, it is a thing of beauty. There's steam coming off of it. I don't know if you can see that. So you can hear this crispy crust as I squeeze, but look at how tender and chewy and soft the inside is. Let's put a little smear of cream cheese on. Cheers. I'm gonna need a minute. Okay guys, something you need to know about me. <laughs> I freaking love food. I love cooking. I love experimenting in the kitchen. Something magical happens when you make food and this bagel right now is magical. It's just magical. This is so good. It's that, again, crispy, crunchy exterior, but that soft and tender and chewy inside. I cannot wait for you guys to make these bagels yourselves. They are honestly, just a game changer, that very slight tanginess from the sourdough that comes out. Oh my gosh. 
It's so good. And again, I just wanna say, I just think that the bagel is so versatile. You can use it just like a traditional bagel with a little bit of cream cheese. You can turn them into breakfast sandwiches. One of my favorite ways to eat these is open face spread with some mashed avocado and over easy eggs. Oh my gosh, it's so good for breakfast. And then again, the Asiago cheese ones, I like them for breakfast, but they also make amazing lunch sandwiches too. And again, like I said earlier, you can really start to change up the flavor profiles based on the toppings that you add to. So have fun with it, experiment, find your favorite combinations, or stick with just the basic plain bagel. You can't go wrong with it. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did. I hope you are dying to make these at home because they are so worth it. And I hope you picked up a few tips and tricks for baking with sourdough, particularly making sourdough bagels, if this is something that you are wanting to try. I know you're gonna have amazing, amazing success. Leave me a comment down below. If you do try this recipe, let me know what you think. You can also find me over on Instagram at Barney underscore Homestead. Would love to hear from you there as well if you give this recipe a try. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you all in my next video. Bye.